is the crime and crime policy session. And we're, uh, we're very fortunate to have two great speakers with us for the session. Um, Aaron will be speaking first and MJ will be speaking second. And I'll introduce each of them before they speak. So we'll start with, uh, with Aaron Gibbs Van Brunschot. She is an associate professor and head of the Department of Sociology at the University of Calgary. Her primary research interests are in the realms of crime, security, and risk. Her current research focuses on the concept of offender management and the assessment of various technologies that are used to enhance public security. Without further ado, Erin Brunschot. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? It's all working? All right, thank you so much. I want to first say thank you to the Parkland Institute for inviting me to talk about this, what I consider a very important issue. I'm hoping that some of the, the issues that I do raise aren't going to, again, be redundant to some of the things that you've heard over the course of the weekend. But I think it's a really interesting topic and certainly something that should give us pause for thought. I wanted to begin by suggesting that there, it is a common lament now of researchers who study crime and deviance that their research is not taken up by policymakers. This is a common lament of many researchers, but certainly when it comes to the realm of crime, it seems as though policy does not conform well with what it is known or what has been known with regard to the causes and the consequences of crime and crime policy. So why would policymakers not take up evidence produced from empirically sound research to guide their policy decision making. I'm going to review a number of issues that probably point to reasons why crime policy is not informed by research, but I thought that I would begin first of all by taking a look at what crime policy is in Canada. So perhaps in a criminologist's dream world, we would have a situation whereby evidence would be informing policymakers and policymakers would in turn inform the public and that there would be some sort of linear relationship. We know, however, that this is not the case and that often policy is not informed by research and is informed as often by public opinion. The difficulties, of course, with public opinion is that it's not based on anything other than what is presented often by the media or in terms of personal experiences. I think we all know of people who've had at least some fleeting encounter with crime or have been victimized by crime, but clearly those individual experiences don't necessarily make the best basis for crime policy. So in terms, this is going to be old news for many of you, but public policy is typically considered to be a collection of objectives, principles, and or missions used to guide thinking on an issue or set of issues. Laws and regulations are the tools by which policy objectives are attained. Health policy in Canada, for example, is noted to, to be to protect, promote, and restore the physical and mental well-being of residents of Canada, and to facilitate reasonable access to health services without financial or other barriers. But the crime policy in Canada is somewhat different, obviously, because it's dealing with a different, or a different subject matter. And it is constituted at the federal level within the Safe Streets and Communities Act, an omnibus crime bill which allowed the government to create a number of changes to existing legislation, as well as to create new changes or new acts such as the Justice for Victims of Terrorism Act and amending certain things like the Criminal Code, the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, and the Youth Criminal Justice Act, to name a few. When it comes to the specifics then, though, we understand that there are a number of legal ramifications of policies, but I wanted to take a look more specifically at what the policy is behind the, uh, the Omnibus Crime Bill, or Bill C-10. I call it, for shorthand, Safe Streets Act, or Bill C-10. What we find is that rather than dealing with what researchers would probably, many of us, deem to be important policy implications, such as equity, justice, redemption, that sort of thing, this instead is a focus more so on accountability and punishment. So the top priority, according to the government, is the safety of Canadian families. 
And they suggest that this is going to be um, achieved through focusing on two specific aspects. The first is putting victims first, as well as holding offenders accountable. So when you look at some of the term or the, the words that are used with respect to these sorts of orientations, first they suggest that putting victims first will result or is going to include enshrining victims' rights to participate in things like parole hearings, as well as to address inmate accountability, responsibility, and management. They also suggest that they will allow victims to sue perpetrators and supporters of terrorism. They're also going to, they suggest, take into account victim characteristics when sentencing, such as age, health, and financial situation, with a specific emphasis on elder abuse. The holding offenders accountable is a little bit more specific, and that includes things like increased penalties for sex offenses. I've highlighted some of the words, as maybe you can see in blue, that suggest a certain orientation towards uh, crime policy. Targeting organized crime and imposing tougher sentences for drug offenses, protecting the public from violent and repeat young offenders. I should also add that this is uh, it's a selection. It doesn't include absolutely everything that was included in the crime bill, but I have selected to give you a, an idea of what the flavor of the, the policy is like. Eliminating the use of conditional sentences for serious and violent crimes, extending the ineligibility, ineligibility period for record suspension, meaning that you have to have a longer period of time before your record can essentially be waived clean, as well as authorizing immigration officers to refuse work permits to vulnerable foreign nationals if they believe that they are determined to be at risk of humiliating or degrading treatment, including sexual exploitation. The last one here is a direct quote, quote reforming a citizen's power to arrest, as well as to update Canada's outdated self-defense and defense of property laws to help ensure law-abiding Canadians know the law is on their side. So this dual focus on victimization and offender accountability constitutes what is often referred to as a law and order mandate. The Conservative Party platform in a document is noted to say, quote, Stephen Harper's government shares the common sense beliefs of law-abiding Canadians and we will continue to pursue our law and order agenda. While it's difficult to know exactly what common sense beliefs might constitute, we certainly can figure out what a law and order agenda is, and it's essentially a tough on crime mantra, which includes increasing punitiveness with a focus on retribution. Nowhere does the policy reflect any sort of insight that has been gathered from data and from research findings that suggest that prevention and rehabilitation are more likely to go further with respect to eliminate, well not eliminating, but reducing the likelihood of crime. So just in terms of the research evidence that, that is available to policymakers, obviously there is a ton of data associated with crime and, and criminal activity. This would be uh, found in the form of official statistics as well as uh, official statistics from both policing and corrections and court data to research-driven survey data and experimental results. Data, however, only becomes evidence when a clearly defined question is posed and alternative explanations are considered. Again, evidence has pointed to prevention and rehabilitation as being the most significant ways in which we might impact the commission of crime. However, this does not seem to be taken into account with regard to current policy. One of the things I wanted to suggest here as well is that when I'm talking about, I've, you'll note that I've got research in brackets, I'm talking more specifically about academic research, although there could and there is evidence produced by other bodies, such as practitioners. I'm leaving that aside for the time being and focusing primarily on research-based evidence. So in Canada, the party in power typically passes anti-crime legislation in the form of bills which are translated into law. The State Streets and Communities Act is the basis of criminal policy in Canada today, and it was pushed through Parliament, one could argue, in 2012 after having a relatively short time frame in which to be heard. While there was some debate with respect to this bill from opposition parties, the bill was ultimately passed. In the Canadian system, crime policy may be challenged by interest groups, 
opposition parties, as well as challenged by various provinces in their willingness or lack thereof to enforce the specifics of the bill. One of the common, or some of the commentary with regard to the passing of Bill C-10 had to do with Ontario and Quebec specifically saying they didn't think they could manage this because it was going to be too expensive and therefore they were protesting the bill in that way. One of the things that Katie just brought up in, the, in her talk was that even Texas had commented on how it was that this was not going to serve the interests of Canadians and they themselves had learned from their own mistakes and were pushing back on their own law and order agenda. In the United States, we haven't come to this particular point, but in the United States, for example, when dealing with um, sex offending, there's been a number of acts that have been passed at the federal level. These have been pushed down to the state level, and states are actually in the position of having to fulfill the parameters of that federal level legislation or risk lack of funding from the federal government. So if they don't impose the federal legislation, they will have funding pulled back. So this could be a consequence, although this hasn't happened in this particular um, case yet. The public perception, uh, we are often depicted in Canada as being somewhat more forgiving and tolerant than our southern neighbors. However, they are, or because they tend to be thought of as particularly punitive and harsh. Yet the distinctions, I think, are starting to become a little bit less distinct in the passing, certainly, of the Omnibus Crime Bill, as well as the pulling back by certain levels, or certain states and certain federal policy with regard to the, uh, the crime policy in the United States. One of the things that Bottoms, who is a, a crime or a criminologist, suggests is that there is a theme of populist punitiveness that characterizes public perception and public opinion. He suggests that this consists of reducing crime through increasingly harsh punishment, as well as affirming moral outrage against criminal activity by ensuring that there is harsh punishment. Unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, public opinion and public perception is not necessarily informed by evidence or research findings, but is, of course, informed by the media as well as personal experience. So just turning to the challenges, why hasn't crime or why hasn't research-based findings been taken up by policymakers? The first reason or the first challenge to this relationship, I would suggest, has to do with the fact that crime policy is often used as political capital. Without a doubt, discussions of crime and crime policy fan the flames of strong emotions with the result often being support for politicians who promise to stamp out crime. However, some criminologists have observed that rather than this tough on crime approach being associated with the political left or right, that it is, a I've used the word mantra before, it is sort of a theme that is taken up by both ends of the political spectrum. However, the, the way, of course, nobody wants crime, but the ways in which you get rid of crime or deal with it will vary uh, obviously quite significantly between political parties at various ends of the, the spectrum. The ways in which one might suggest you could be tough on crime, though, tend to reflect a couple of dimensions. The first dimension is social inclusion, building a welfare state and focusing on those who are socially in need, including the mentally ill, for example. The second dimension, social exclusion, is basically defined by a neoliberal political economy and an orientation to cutbacks and economic savings. One of the quotes I found with respect to this tough on crime policy and how it's tended to change over the last little while, certainly with the, the last omnibus crime bill, Mary Campbell, who is a, the former Director General of the Corrections and Criminal Justice Directorate at Public Safety Canada, suggests that Canada was once a leader in crime policy and was able to embrace the complexity of tough on crime and was a model for other countries to emulate. She notes that today, the deeply, quote, the deeply embedded nastiness of the current governing party is constantly displayed in their actions, whether it be creating even more punitive carceral conditions, erecting barriers to reintegration, never letting the offender be more than the worst thing they have ever done, and using victims for political ends. The list is truly endless. Another difficulty or challenge with respect to the taking up of evidence with respect to crime policy 
is that it's difficult in some ways to note what has been, how have changes, if we see changes in crime and crime rates, that sort of thing, can we actually attribute those changes to existing crime policy? So in 2011, in the United States, the incarceration rate was 716 per 100,000. In Canada, it was 118,000, or pardon me, no, 118 per 100,000. When we consider crime rates, we note the trend downward over the course of the last 20 years in both the US and Canada. Can the declines in crime rates be attributed to a tough on crime policy? We note, or I have noted earlier, that the US has had a fairly significant tough on crime orientation, whereas we have sort of grown into that point over the last few years, I would argue, at least with respect to a punitive orientation. Most academic research indicates that rather than any sort of crime policy implications, the, dec the decline that we see in crime rates has primarily to do with the fact that we're looking at a uh, different demographic makeup than we once were. So this slide is meant to suggest that to you that in 2012 we see a fairly strong, strongly punitively oriented crime policy Whereas these statistics suggest that this, we are currently in 2012 looking at crime rates that are the same as what they were in about 1972. So clearly there was a peak in the early 90s, but the decline has been significant over the course of the last few years. Similarly, the incarceration rate has, is level essentially over the, the course of the last at least 10 or so years. This is different, of course, than what we might see in the United States where the incarcerate, incarceration rate has continued to rise over that particular similar time period. One of the things that is important to note is with respect to the success or the ability to suggest that crime policy has influenced crime uh, rate success or some sort of measures of success in terms of reduction in crime is that there may in fact be spurious connections. One of the things that some politicians, not all politicians, but some certainly like to do is suggest that if you look at the, um, the lowering of the crime rate in Canada, the, the declines in crime rate, that that is due to their policies. But of course it could be obviously a spurious connection and it may, as researchers have suggested, be far more due to demographics than anything else. Some significant feedback with respect to the consequences or the ways in which we might look at how crime policy has actually impacted crime or what, what crime policy could do in the future with respect to the consequences of policy has been, I think, well articulated by the Canadian Bar Association. This document that they put out actually was 10 reasons to oppose Bill C-10 but I've only highlighted a few of those reasons here. But they suggest that in, this crime policy is not going to impact crime for a number of reasons. The first one being that it ha has ignored the reality. And the reality, they suggest, is that research has shown, as I pointed out earlier, that addressing poverty and providing the mentally ill with appropriate services, as well as diverting young people, has actually had more impact on crime rates and the production of crime than other sorts of solutions, such as throwing more people in jail. I think the, uh, the obvious point there is that as the, the US crime rate, or sorry, incarceration rate has risen, we still see the decline. So there's actually no relationship between some of these supposed crime policies and the reality of um, the, um, the situation. The other thing that they complain about, not complain about, that they oppose with respect to Bill C-10 is a legitimate uh, issue in the fact that the Conservative government indicated that they were going to push through the Bill C-10 in order to have it passed within the first 100 days of the sitting of Parliament. This, they argue, did not allow experts or experts to come and comment on the nature of the changes within the proposed crime bill, nor did it allow public consultation or Parliament itself to have a, a good enough idea as to what was included within the bill. The other thing they suggest is that wasting youth is, rather than putting more or taking more youth out of their, uh, out of jail and that sort of thing, this is going to be putting more people, more youth in jail, potentially having them mix with other people who legitimately should be there. 
So in, incarcerating more youth is not necessarily going to prohibit or influence a reduction in crime. The other point here, the punishments eclipse the crime. This is the notion of eliminating conditional sentences for violent and serious criminals, but also it eliminates conditional sentences for both minor and property offenses. This means that more people will be incarcerated. So on that, that chart that I showed you before, reflecting incarceration rates, what we are likely to see with the imposition of these uh, parameters of Bill C-10 is that we're going to see more people incarcerated over the course of the next few years and not fewer. They also suggest that by putting more people in jail for more things that aren't necessarily very serious, you're going to be training predators in that they, certain people who shouldn't be there in the first place will now be associating with others who perhaps legitimately should be. By ensuring or by proposing things like limited or removing conditional sentencing, they suggest that there's going to be even more of a justice system overload. As well, the final couple of points here, victimizing the most vulnerable, if there are no things, no such things as um, conditional sentences or the imposition of mandatory minimum sentences, this may remove individuals who are most vulnerable from remote communities and have them go to places that are obviously not close to their homes and therefore will uh, impact their ability to reintegrate into society once more. The last point, how much money, there's never been any indication with regard or from the, the federal government with respect to how much money all of these sorts of things are going to cost. It costs a lot of money to keep people in jail. The, the economics of crime tend to suggest that it takes less money to prevent crime than it does to throw people into prison at the end of the, the road. So just a few more points here with respect to challenges. I wanted to talk about the role of emotions. I had mentioned that just briefly earlier. But one of the things that, that tends to be the case with crime and speaking about crime is that there are basically two emotions that are often generated, fear and anger together or, at least, or separately. So in some research that was done by Goodall, Slater, and Myers, they suggest that there are these two primary responses to crime events. Fear, they suggest, however, tends to produce a feeling of uncertainty and is more likely, they suggest, to lead to systematic processing of a situation. Anger, on the other hand, when it's produced, it tends to be less systematic and more heuristic. And when anger is produced, there's a tendency to point the finger and to blame more so than in the context of fear. Now, I, I think that there's uh, ways in which we could argue this, but certainly when you look at the role of the media, I think that anger tends to be the response more so potentially than uh, fear. So with regard to the media, most of us get our information about crime, as I was saying before, either from the media or from some sort of personal experience. As with other forms of communication, the media frame stories about crime depending and suppress certain information while highlighting other information. Framing theory, for instance, suggests that by making particular aspects of stories more accessible, subsequent interpretations of a phenomenon may be skewed according to the emphasis provided. The public is exposed to a great deal of crime stories. It is part of our cultural lexicon, this notion of crime and, and committing deviant acts. What happens, however, is that there is a disproportionate focus, as many of you might guess, on crimes that are rare and relatively uncommon. That previous, the crime rate uh, table, the chart that I had showed you earlier, suggests that violent crime, that was the flat line, I don't know if I didn't go over that very carefully, but the flat line in the crime rate is, remains relatively low in terms of the entire proportion of crimes that are committed uh, generally. Anyways, by focusing on the front, they also focus on, the media tend to focus on front ends of the, the crime process rather than the back end. So for example, if you're looking at the policing, policing angle and how there's X number of arrests and that sort of thing, you, have the, the, uh, you may interpret as a reader of these sorts of, of stories that there is a greater success of crime policy than there actually is. We don't hear generally as a public how many individuals remain incarcerated for certain offenses and that sort of thing. So there's a front end focus which makes it seem as though policy is more effective than it actually is. So I, I put these individuals here. This is a case in Calgary that's um, currently being heard. 
but they're an example of the types of emotional response that might be generated by the media. These were two guys that beat up and killed an individual in an alley, and so they're currently being charged. But these are the types of images. This I took from the Calgary Sun. So they like to have these sorts of uh, images on the cover, which produce fear and or anger. So the last one minute that I have, academics, I think, are to blame for a lot of this failed relationship between policymakers and evidence. We hear a lot of, uh, a lot of talk these days with regard to knowledge translation. One of the things that academics are frequently blamed for, and I think rightly, is that they don't organize and present findings in ways that other people can take them up and understand. When we talk about crime rates, this is a, you know, there's certain calculations, but an academic, for example, might be as likely to focus on the calculation of the crime rate as they are on the consequences of the crime rate. So we have to, as academics, I think, posture ourselves somewhat more and organize um, our findings in ways that are going to be taken up. One of the things that I know in my own research, which has to do with the offender management, which was mentioned earlier, is that even basic words like research are not understood the same ways by the police, for example, or by the government as they are by researchers. So we're not even necessarily speaking the same language. Audience receptivity, we have to again make sound bites that are going to be meaningful to those individuals. The last point here, prioritizing public dissemination. We have set ourselves up so that we really don't um, embrace public communication or, or the public's taking up of our findings. When we go and look at merit assessments, we have basically three sorts of parameters, but the heaviest parameter in which we are evaluated is on publications. It's not publications with respect to public communication, it has everything to do with refereed publications. So we don't credit people who actually make an attempt to speak to the public in ways that I think would be more successful. Last slide. The, uh, so it's not all bad, is the uh, conclusion of this. But one of the things that, again, in some of the research that I've done, the best solution to ensuring that people take up your research is to form partnerships with them. It doesn't mean that you're going to side with government and their particular orientation to various events, but it means that you are establishing a question that you can answer together and that they will potentially be more receptive to the, the findings if they've had a voice in potentially laying out the question. I know with the police officers I've worked with, they, say they are totally on side because they feel like they are participants and they have a stake in how it is that we are um, approaching our research. The very last point, has to do with raising the level of public debate. One of the things that I think we focus on too much is the specifics of our research having some sort of implication with respect to um, pinpointing how it is that X finding will impact Y policy. What might be a more fruitful avenue is if we were to look at how we might raise the level of public debate and beginning and talk about the concepts that are listed in the middle portion of this slide rather than suggesting that my study has to have an impact on that policy. It should be that offender management discussions should be brought into the realm of public communication and policy debates. So with that, I'm done. Thank you. That was a great overview. Thank you very much, Aaron. It uh, actually makes me think that Chris Hedges made a good point uh, on Friday night when he said that uh, seems like the south of the border they make a mistake and then ten years later we're, we're follow suit so it seems like a great example of that. Um, <clears throat> so our next speaker is MJ Malloy. MJ holds a doctorate in epidemiology and focuses on the links between illicit drug use, marginalization and infectious disease. As a postdoctoral fellow at the v Faculty of Medicine at the University of British Columbia he works on issues around HIV AIDS, treatment among illicit drug users. Dr. Malloy contributed to the scientific evaluation of Insight, North America's first supervised injection facility for people who use injection drugs in Vancouver's downtown east side. Thank you, Mjoy. And uh, I will try and answer Aaron's call to do a better job of knowledge translation. As, as an academic, I, I am probably victim or responsible for uh, uh, at some time focusing more on the calculation than on the result. Uh, 
Uh, so hopefully I'll, I'll be presenting results uh, today. And uh, I want to first start off by thanking uh, Parkland, uh, all of the staff and volunteers for the invitation to speak today, both uh, on my behalf as well as on behalf of my co-authors and co-investigators. And together what we did is we uh, worked on the scientific evaluation of insight. And Erin and I thought that the best thing to do would be for her to start off with a great overview of the relationships between policy and crime and evidence. Uh, and I would try and present a much more sort of case study example of what we experienced uh, working on the inside evaluation. And I'm going to tell a story about this neighborhood. This is the downtown east side in Vancouver. Um, journalists, I hate journalists. Uh, I used to be a journalist. Um, uh, often call it Vancouver's poorest postal code which is true, but it also excludes and, and uh, 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 hides as much as it reveals. One of the um, uh, defining characteristics of the neighborhood is that many of the people live uh, in these sort of uh, what we call single room occupancy hotels. Fifty years ago when the downtown east side was the center of Vancouver, uh, this was uh, uh, where union men and women stayed uh, after their jobs, but now of course they are generally flop houses, uh, there is no sanitation, there is very poor bathrooms, there is no um, um, uh, kitchens. Uh, and another defining characteristic is this, is drug use. Uh, this is a woman who is injecting herself probably with heroin or cocaine uh, in an alleyway behind the main intersection at Main and Hastings. As you can tell, this is a common occurrence both by her and others because of the injection equipment which lies scattered at her feet. Because of this, because of this very high intensity, very dangerous drug use, uh, it is also characterized by death and disease. Uh, this is a man who is mourning the loss of thousands of our fellow citizens to uh, uh, overdose uh, in, the, in the late 90s. Uh, they, the activists put up a uh, field of crosses to demonstrate how many people we had lost to overdose. And in that time, in the late 90s, we also became aware as scientists that the neighborhood was also the site of a terrible uh, an explosive outbreak of HIV AIDS among people who use drugs. This is Dr. David Patrick who is a uh, public health physician who is one of the members of the team which identified the fact that it was the worst outbreak ongoing in the Western world. In Vancouver the uh, amount of HIV among drug users for many years was very stable. About 1 in 100 drug users were living with HIV but by the height of the epidemic it's estimated that 1 in 4 drug users were infected with HIV and this changed in the, process, in the, in the period of just months. Uh, unfortunately some of the hardest hit in the epidemic and the outbreak were uh, individuals of Aboriginal ancestry who were becoming infected at the time at twice the rate of non-Aboriginal drug users. And unfortunately this story is not unique to Vancouver and indeed uh, throughout the world the, the face of the HIV AIDS pandemic is increasingly outside of Sub-Saharan Africa this face right here of drug users and their sexual partners who are becoming infected all over the world uh, uh, at very staggering rates. Globally we estimate that there are about 15 million people around the world who use injection drugs uh, and about one in five of them are living with HIV AIDS outside of sub-Saharan Africa. One in four new infections is among drug users and some of the worst outbreaks and the most uncontrolled outbreaks in the world now uh, are among drug users. There are really, uh, uh, getting into policy, two general responses that people have come up with for this, uh, this terrible problem. The first uh, is a public health based response which says that drug use is a, uh, uh, an indicator, a function of addiction which is a chronic, often lifelong condition rooted in neuropsychology and genetics. And out of this uh, 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 viewpoint in Vancouver came in 1997 uh, the declaration of a public health emergency uh, after the uh, outbreak was first um, noticed and leading from that what we call the four pillars strategy. The idea that drug use in Vancouver should be uh, um, uh, met with four different policy approaches. Uh, education about the dangers of drug use, prevention of drug use especially among the youth, uh, enforcement of drug laws and harm reduction. You know, of those, probably harm reduction is one that you may have heard of and certainly the most controversial. Uh, it is the idea that we can try and uh, uh, protect individuals from suffering the harms and the consequences of drug use, overdose, HIV, bacterial infections, without insisting that they stop being drug users. Uh, and this is um, a, uh, uh, an idea that has given rise to many different sorts of interventions all around the world, needle exchange programs,
methadone maintenance, supervised injection facilities. These are all examples of sort of low cost, low barrier interventions that we have to try and uh, protect drug users from becoming infected with HIV and dying of overdoses. I'm not going to say they're not controversial. Even in Vancouver, there's still many people who say, look, I don't want a needle exchange in my neighborhood. You know, I don't want to see these things on my block. And this is often the reaction of people who are living in these sorts of environments, that they don't want to see a needle exchange because they think that that will therefore attract those people to their neighborhoods. And speaking as someone uh, uh, who lives just a couple blocks from Insight, uh, I can certainly understand that point of view, but for me, uh, I will certainly protect uh, as much as I can the ability of Insight to be just blocks from my house. I should also point out I should also point out that these uh, interventions are not only uh, the, the, the uh, supported um, by drug use activists and other public health professionals, but they are also the official policy of the United Nations and the World Health Organization, which mandates in all settings to protect drug users from HIV AIDS, these nine things should be available. And top of the list are needle and syringe programs because they have been medically proven time and time again to reduce the risk of HIV among drug users. The other response and to drug use, to the problem of drug use, to the problem of drug users, is what I'll call a public order based response. And this response is that drug use is a crime, that possession and use of certain substances like crack, uh, like heroin, like cocaine, uh, should be punished. And through this zero tolerance, just say no prohibition, we can, uh, 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 we can prohibit the use of drugs and we can convince people not to use drugs. This necessarily leads to the criminalization of people who use drugs. And we can see it played out on our streets, our safe streets and our safe communities, uh, time and time again. Uh, in, the, in New York City, for example, they have an official policy of stop and frisk, which generally means that the NYPD will stop young black males in the hopes of catching drugs on them. It also means that for many drug users, one defining aspect of their lives is that they go in and out of the correctional system. It is a revolving door. And often they're in the prison system as much for misbehaving within that system as they are for the drug use itself. And of course, this criminalization further marginalizes and stigmatizes an already vulnerable uh, and, and, and marginalized uh, community. Uh, you know, for example, in Florida, if you're convicted of a, of a drug crime, that is a felony and felons are not allowed to vote. So the political rights of someone have been taken away and are taken away just because, I would argue, because of their addiction. We have seen uh, over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, many researchers have identified several very important health impacts of this criminalization system. Obviously, uh, it drives people away from the healthcare system. In Thailand, for example, if a doctor uh, suspects that his or her patient is a drug user, they are required by law to report that to the authorities. Obviously, if you're a drug user, you do not want to go, therefore, to a doctor in Thailand. This is some of the ways that it complicates access to harm reduction. In Vancouver and many other places, if you're a drug user uh, and you're caught with clean needles by the police, that is evidence for them that you are a drug user and that you might want to be arrested uh, and incarcerated. The best thing that the criminalization system does, or the most effective thing that it does, is it puts people in prison. This is a, 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 a graph showing the number of people in prison in the United States from 1972, when Richard Nixon declared a war on drugs, to uh, the present day. And you can see that the uh, uh, number of people has skyrocketed astronomically. Until now, per capita, the United States is the largest uh, 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 jailer of its citizens in the world far beyond China you know, or, or Russia or any of the other places we might think are more punitive states. Now, of course, it's, uh, it's solved the problem, though, in the United States, right? You can't get drugs in the U.S. anymore, right? <laughs> um, I'm uh, sorry to say that, um, in fact, what has happened over the same time period is that drugs have become cheaper, they have become more potent, and they have become easy to get. This is data from the United States government, so it's not from crazy researchers like me. Uh, it is, in fact, government data which shows, the blue bar shows how much money they're spending on the drug control system. And it has gone up from about $3 billion 
to over $23 billion per year. At the same time, the retail cost, which is the green line, has come down. I kind of feel like Al Gore right now, it's really weird. And then uh, the purity, and this is heroin we're talking about, has increased. So let's turn uh, from the public order side of things to the public health. This is Insight, which I'll talk about now. It's, this is the front door, and you can see actually uh, that corner right there is Hastings and Maine. It's set right in the middle of the drug use area. It was opened in 2003. People can go to Insight and they can object substances that they have obtained outside under the supervision of a nurse. It's important to note that Insight uh, uh, operates under an exemption from Canada's drug laws provided by the Federal Minister of Health. In 2003, when the facility opened, that was Alan Rock, a liberal. Now, of course, it is a, it is a conservative. Uh, the condition to get that exemption was that Insight was also the uh, uh, subject of a large, multi-million dollar uh, scientific evaluation on the facility's impacts on HIV and OD. This is the injection room in Insight. First time I went in there, I thought it looked like a sort of a Montreal hair salon. Uh, it is, um, uh, there are 12 injection uh, seats, booths, uh, watched over by a nurse who's at the left there. Uh, individuals, when they come into the room, they uh, take up that basket of uh, sterile injection equipment uh, and they can object uh, their drugs uh, under the nurse's care. If they overdose, the nurse can revive them. Uh, also, after they inject, uh, they can see a nurse for wound care uh, and whenever they want, they can see an addictions counselor who can often get them into the rehab facility, which is upstairs, or detox in the Vancouver area. As I said, it was the subject of a very large evaluation. This is a map from one of those studies. There are over two dozen studies published uh, in scientific journals. And this map shows the city of Vancouver, uh, and it shows the location for every drug overdose death for a five-year period. Uh, between, uh, with the opening of Insight in the middle, right? So two and a half years on either side. So the red dots sh show where uh, people died, and obviously the big cluster at the top there is the downtown east side. The yellow dot is Insight, uh, and obviously Insight was set there because, of course, that's where all the drug overdose deaths occur. What we did uh, is, when we, is when we analyzed those deaths, we figured out the death rate for each block of the downtown east side. So before the facility opened, that's on the left. And after the facility opened, that's on the right. And gray is better. Gray means less deaths in that block. And what we, long story short, there was a 35% decrease in the number of deaths around Insight compared to a 9% decrease in the rest of the city of Vancouver. So this was a statistically significant decrease in the overdose death rate around Insight compared to further away. So we found many uh, beneficial impacts of Insight. In addition to the decrease in death rates, we also found a 30% increase in uptake of addiction treatment. We found decreases in syringe sharing, so decreases in HIV risk. And as I said, these, these articles were published in over two dozen of the top public uh, journals in the world, including Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. In short, what we found was that Insight has had a beneficial impact on some of Vancouver's most marginalized and most vulnerable citizens. And fortunately, uh, that evidence was taken up by a whole huge coalition of citizens groups uh, who wanted to keep the facility open. This is the church just down the street from Insight, which is now basically a homeless shelter. Uh, and they had uh, you know, regular events trying to keep the facility open. As I mentioned, there was a, uh, the Insight opens, has opened because of the uh, exemption from the drug laws. But the minister, when they came in, quickly said that that exemption might be removed and Insight therefore might have to close. That was a whole part of a campaign against Insight that was run by uh, opponents of the facility. For example, the RCMP said that Insight, by encouraging drug use or by providing a safe place for drug use to happen, that Insight was encouraging drug use. Uh, the drug czar uh, under George W. Bush came to Vancouver and he said the same thing. Uh, he said that what you're just doing is you're enabling drug users and this is going to spread drug use. People are going to come to Vancouver from other parts of the country. Uh, these are all things that we never actually found in the scientific evaluation. The uh, police union of Vancouver police officers said the same sort of thing. We've created this enabling environment that has resulted in a sense of entitlement among drug addicts, said the head of the Vancouver police union. 
the opponents even went so far as to create this uh, online, uh, supposedly academic research journal, which published the only article uh, that was critical of insight. Uh, this article was a critique of Canada's insight. It was published by the head of the Drug Prevention Network of Canada. And we later found out that the report itself was paid for directly by the RCMP. <laughs> Never mind, though, this was enough for the Minister of Health to declare that there was an academic debate. Mr. Clement said that there were new questions raised by this, uh, 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 this research that had to be answered with more evidence. Uh, that the very same day he said this, he uh, cancelled all of the research funding to create more of that evidence. Clearly there's a public debate going on and clearly there is an academic debate going on, he insisted. So this was all a part of a sort of a wide campaign by the Conservative government to politicize or to misrepresent the evidence that we generated about the SIF. Um, and there was a whole bunch of things that took place. And this is unfortunately what I'll suggest is part of the Conservative government's uh, campaign to win partisan points on the backs of drug users. This is a, a flyer that I received on my doorstep in a recent election and Mr. Harper says uh, that we owe no debt to convicted criminals and that people should be serving time and not being served. Uh, according to Mr. Harper, voting uh, is a perk of uh, 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 an excessive prison perk. Similarly, as, as Aaron has so well explained, um, a tough on crime policy was one of the things that they have promised and in fact they have delivered on. One of the, in the omnibus bill there are mandatory minimums now for certain uh, drug offenses. So people who are convicted of these offenses must spend two years in jail, no matter of the, you know, the reasons for. At the time Mr. Harper said that they are going to go after traffickers. However, if you read the bill, passing a joint at a party is drug trafficking and it will get you two years in jail. More recently, uh, the Conservative government um, ended a, uh, a program which provides prescription heroin to some of the people in the downtown east side. Now, you might say it's crazy to be giving uh, people who are drug users heroin, but know that they are uh, participants in a randomized controlled trial which has shown that uh, prescribing them heroin has shown tremendous benefits to their personal and mental health. And in terms of scientific ethics, it's necessary that if an individual participates in research and benefits from it, it's necessary for you to continually give them access to the medication that they have benefited from. Uh, Ms. Ambrose uh, cancelled that, and the very next day the Conservative Party sent a fundraising letter to their supporters asking for money to support these actions. Now these are the sorts of actions uh, that have gone uh, against this man, who's Dean Wilson. Uh, he is a long time, I don't think Dean will mind me telling you he's a long time drug user, and he is a founding member of the Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users, which is a very important group in Vancouver which tries to uh, support their rights to, to treatment and hu human rights. In 2007, uh, facing the, the, the threat of closing the facility, they took the federal government to court, saying that closing the facility would breach their charter rights to security of the person. Uh, in 2008, a judge at the Supreme Court of BC agreed. Mr. Justice Ian Pitfield said that while there is no Nothing to be said in favor of injecting controlled substances. Uh, there is much to be said about denying people healthcare services that will ameliorate the effects of this condition. So he supported the idea that this should be a public health based response to addiction. Uh, in 2011, after it had been appealed by the government, the Supreme Court of Canada unanimously ruled that Insight had to remain open, and that closing it would be a vi violation of the Charter rights, and that uh, they ruled that Insight saves lives, its benefits have been proven. There is no discernible negative impact on the public safety and health objectives of Canada during its years of operation. So this, uh, in some ways, is where I'll end, and it's, uh, it was in some ways uh, the triumph of evidence over more sort of partisan politics. And I want to end with one more part of, uh, of evidence. This is the end of the story about the HIV out outbreak in Vancouver. We started with that tremendous jump, explosive outbreak in the number of, 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 of new cases. Uh, and since then, we have seen a tremendous decline in the number of new cases per year among drug users. As a result, not only of insight, but of a whole campaign of public health-based uh, interventions to reduce the risk of HIV among drug users. Uh, and this, I think, is the real triumph of insight um, to uh, uh, being a part of this campaign to protect people's health. So, that's where I'll end. Thank you.
Got me? Thank you very much, MJ. That was fantastic. Um, we have about 20 minutes now for questions, and I'm sure everyone's heard this speech a few times now about uh, please keep your questions or comments brief, uh, be constructive. We'd like to hear from everybody and keep a certain uh, balance in the room. So let's have at it. Uh, do, do you want to take three questions at a time or sure, one question? Whatever, yeah. One at a time? Whatever you think is best. Okay. Let's go with one at a time for now. Uh, this gentleman in the middle, please. Oh, there's a, there's a mic coming, sir. Here you go. Uh, has anything in your research or your study uh, given you any insight into why so many First Nations people are in Canadian jails? Am I on? Yes. One of the, uh, I think one of the, probably one of the most significant findings with respect to some of the individuals, Native individuals found in jail is this notion of uh, cumulative disadvantage. When you come from a, or when there are cultural factors working against you, mainstream culture not necessarily accepting uh, Native individuals into some of the realms that others are accepted into, that coupled with uh, addictions issues and that sort of thing, it seems to have resulted in a greater proportion of Natives in, in jail. But I think it's the, the, the thing that I draw on when I'm looking at that is, uh, so in this offender management study that I'm doing, we've taken a look at high risk offenders. And rather than, uh, of course, they're, they're, uh, they're not positive individuals, but what we do see amongst them is a, a lifetime of disadvantage, not just amongst Aboriginals, but also among the um, Caucasian offenders as well. But the, uh, their disadvantage starts you know, as children, really. And the accumulation of those negative factors, school, uh, fail, failed school performance, um, families that are not cohesive, no job experience, that sort of thing, all of these things start to accumulate. So at, at the time, you know, as adults, they really stand little chance of success. That's amongst the high risk offenders, but many of those same characteristics, I think, could be found amongst uh, Aboriginal populations as well. Yeah, I'll echo what, what Aaron says. I think that obviously, um, it would be easy for us to enumerate many of the um, disadvantages that are uh, that Aboriginal people in Canada face with regards to all sorts of social and economic um, uh, uh, markers. Uh, I think um, it's also probably um, within the realm of possibility that the correctional system, uh, like the economic system and the educational system, is in, in large measures designed to maintain and extend the colonization of, of uh, Aboriginal people, uh, the colonization of Aboriginal peoples on this land that we call Canada. Um, from my own viewpoint as a scientist, I'll simply point out that um, in our studies of people in the downtown east side who are drug users, we do not find in fact that Aboriginal people go to prison any more or less often than other non-Aboriginal drug users. Uh, however, the number of, uh, the proportion of individuals in our studies who are Aboriginal uh, is approximately 35 to 40 percent. So. Uh, you can tell that they are overrepresented in this collection of disadvantage and marginalization, um, and and thus it's not surprising to see that they uh, that they are proportionally much more likely to go to jail now. First of all, I want to thank both of you for a tremendous, uh, tremendously important presentation. I was horrified a couple of years ago to hear that the US has privatized much of its prison system and has actually created a prison industry which very vigorously lobbies state and federal governments for increased sentencing and uh, increased minimum sentences in order to keep their numbers up and build more prisons with um, with the Harper government's new, their move towards their law and order agenda and, agenda and this omnibus bill, is it starting to look like that's what's coming north of the border, that we're going to end up with a, a prison industrial complex as well? That's a really good question. I, I don't know if, 
if I would, I don't really anticipate that there will be a, a lot of privatization within the prison system at this point. I, I don't. I know that we do tend to follow what the U.S. does, and there is a lag time. So perhaps in 10 years, as was pointed out, we might see some of those those mistakes. But I I don't really know that there is evidence to suggest that that will occur at this point. You know, I'd agree. Uh, I think that um, unfortunately, I think the seeds have been sown for. Uh, a higher level of incarceration in Canada. Um, you know, that graph that I showed of the huge increase in um, uh, incarceration in the States was driven by mandatory minimums. And of course, mandatory minimums are the very thing that this Harper government has just enacted. So unfortunately, what I think we might see in the coming years is the sort of mass move towards mass incarceration um, that we have seen in the United States. Uh, at the same time, I think that uh, the era of mass incarceration might be ending in the United States because of the privatized system, in that state governors all around the United States have realized just how much of the, their, their budget is going to, um, to private prison corporations, uh, and uh, in fact are beginning to turn away from it, not through any sense of justice or, or, or equity or anything, but because it costs an awful lot of money. Uh, and even in fact, you know, Newt Gingrich, uh, who I don't think we, you know, we'd confuse for a progressive anytime soon, uh, has been one of the figures suggesting that this era of mass incarceration does not make sense any longer. So hopefully by the time they figure it out, we will not have followed in their, in their footsteps. Thanks, great uh, presentations. Uh, drug policy is particularly a good example of where you have different kind of policy options, uh, different frameworks to think of things. And MJ, as you presented, uh, the whole idea of uh, drug usage as being a health issue as opposed to a crime issue. And I'm thinking about uh, what has gone on in Europe. My understanding is, by and large, it's viewed as a health issue. So I'm wondering if either of you have any uh, speculation as why uh, you know, there's different ways of thinking about this, Europe versus the way we tend to look at it here and, and in the United States. Um, I agree that certainly there is, you know, heterogeneity uh, around this issue uh, in the United States or in, in Europe and, and here. Um, you know, for example, Portugal about 10 years ago basically decriminalized all drug use. So that such that if you are uh, caught with heroin or cocaine uh, in Portugal, uh, the police officer is required to take you to a medical clinic, uh, and that it does not become uh, a criminal matter. Um, and you know what they have seen in Portugal uh, is a decrease in the number of HIV cases incidents among drug users, and a decrease in the use of drugs by young people. So this is a horrible result, obviously. Um, I'm not, but you know, at the same time, there are still areas in Europe, such as Great Britain, um, which which are are still on the prohibitionist path, and in fact are are rejecting calls to you know declassify ca cannabis to move it from a Schedule One drug to a, a less a less uh, a dangerous drug in the eyes of the law. Um, but I'm not I'm not sure I can make any sort of generalizations about you know why that is, um, other than maybe just the Portuguese are smart, smarter than us English. Who knows? Yeah, I don't know if I can add that much. I, one of the, um, I think crime, at least in North America, tends to get wrapped up in, um, I'm looking at this article that I had forwarded to MJ, and uh, I think in North America, crime is a morality issue as much as it is anything else. So I think that perhaps the Europeans are somewhat more ahead of us, as they often are, with respect to thinking about this and framing it differently. I think we really have been trained to think that we need to identify bad guys and punish them. And, and uh, so, that, but that's obviously a morally, um, a moral argument, whereas I think that the Europeans have tended to bring it out of that realm of morality and into more of a public health that we just, I don't think we're there yet. Um, so Aaron, you were mentioning that uh, you collaborate with the police and they've been kind of a positive partner in your research. But then MJ, the RCMP seem to be the main antagonist against Insight. Can you explain how and why? 
Yes, uh, RCM, the RCMP have not been um, uh, very much in favor of insight or in fact the idea of harm reduction. Um, and as I said, the, 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 the Vancouver Police Union uh, has also been um, uh, very against insight. However, I should point out that officially the City of Vancouver Police are in favor of insight uh, and support the four pillars strategy, which is enforcement, education, prevention and harm reduction. So there is some heterogeneity amongst the police. We also did a study uh, more recently uh, uh, among the uh, clientele of Insight, and it's, uh, in the study we found that 15% uh, of the people uh, who use Insight, they were referred to Insight by a police officer. Uh, you know, and what we hear often anecdotally is that police officers will find people who are injecting in public or injecting in parks and say, look, you know, you can't do that here. What you should really do is go to Insight and use your drugs at Insight. So, Although there is official opposition for maybe ideological or, mora or morality-based reasons, I think pragmatically it's a bit more complex on, on a day-to-day -day level. Uh, and that's certainly, I think, the, the hope that moving forward in Vancouver, uh, we, can, um, we can have more of those collaborations. Uh, for example, right now, one of the big problems in Vancouver is what's called Check Day, which you see across Canada, whereas it's when all the social assistance checks are dispersed on the very same day. Um, and what this leads to in Vancouver is, is everyone knows who works down there, the, it's the check day phenomenon. And the neighborhood is a complete circus for days afterwards because there's a huge level of binge drug use. And the police have even, in fact come to the operators of Insight and said, can you help us uh, get a handle on this and figure out what to do? Because we're sending all of our officers down here, it's costing us tons of overtime, there's all these assaults, etc. We need to figure out some way of dealing with check day. Uh, so along with the inside operators, we're looking at an, an intervention to try and um, ameliorate the check day problem. And, and so this is what I hope, something that we'll see more of going forward, that there is partnerships like Aaron has, uh, uh, has, has made between the police uh, and, and researchers. Reasons I think, well, there's a couple of reasons why I think that the uh, this research has worked. And again, I would also agree that there's heterogeneity amongst relationships of researchers with police forces. We've been very lucky in Calgary specifically, but I think it has a lot to do with police leadership. And you see how um, researchers are, are welcomed or not, or de depending upon the leadership in place. But I also think one of the reasons why this has worked out well with the Calgary Police at this particular point is it has to do with the nature of the question. These individuals that we are studying at this point are very extreme and the police and researchers and the public would kind of agree that this is a, a study worth doing because these people commit so much crime and to find solutions with respect to how they are managed would really impact on public safety. So I think the, uh, the, the nature of the, the topic that's being studied does impact on the relationship between the, um, the parties. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for an uh, informative talk. I'm a criminal defense lawyer here in Edmonton, and I've come there through philosophy and religious studies. And I think the answer to the question why research is ignored comes down to the religious component of our conservative government that believes in fault and uh, free will. But people on the front lines know that, as, as your, your example, Aaron, about the, the aboriginals. And I recall a judge saying, you'd be surprised if they weren't in, in the criminal courts, is really what's, what's going on. And yet, we, 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 we punish people as if uh, everyone's uh, responsible for their actions. But determinism and cause and effect teaches us that that's just not true. No one's responsible for who they are. And I think this is carried out even in, in the prisons where the authorities think they have the right, and it comes right from the top, right from Harper on down, that they have the right to punish whenever they come across someone. And I think Ashley Smith is a, is a tragic example of that. But it's going on in, in, in Canada all the time. There was a case in Edmonton about a month ago, well, maybe more than a month ago now, but uh, a person was jailed for a LRT warrant and they were placed in a cell with a, a psycho person who stomped them to death. It, c it can happen to anyone, and the way our government is treating people in prisons is really outrageous. It's, it's a third world uh, situation that, that needs to be addressed, and uh, I think the Ashley Smith case uh, happily, in a way, brought that to the, to the public's attention. I think I have to say something about crime rates, because 
In, in Edmonton, for instance, there's more impaired driving charges than the province of BC or Quebec. But that doesn't mean that there's more of that crime being committed here. So crime, crime, crime rates are, uh, uh, can be uh, quite arbitrary. But I think it comes down to it's a war on the poor is what's going on. Uh, and that's what the Conservative government is engaging in. And it's time the majority stood up and voted him out. defense attorney um, <laughs> but no I and I certainly uh, uh, echo some of your your observations one of the, the especially about incarceration in the correctional system uh, right now by the correction by the federal correctional uh, systems own uh, numbers uh, the level of HIV amongst prisoners is um, 20 times the national rate uh, which is not surprising of course because of course we incarcerate so many people with risk factors for HIV uh, but, you know, we also know that drug use continues in prison systems, uh, but the federal government has staunchly refused to put in a needle exchange in prisons, uh, despite the recommendations of all sorts of uh, uh, groups, and despite evidence from Europe that these systems can be delivered safely, humanely, and, and, and effectively. Uh, but this, again, I think is, is part of the Harper, Harper government's, uh, first of all, dismissal of science, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, belief in, in punitive punitive justice. So uh, unfortunately, what it means, I think, is that the prison system is becoming uh, a breeding ground for HIV. Uh, and we will see 20 or 20 years from now, people will be suing the correctional system for getting HIV in jail. Hi, I'm just kind of curious. You had the photo there of um, the United Church in support of Insight. Um, I'm just curious. Undoubtedly, um, the church has been used to reinforce the conservative status quo, but um, there are other more progressive faith-based organizations that are doing good work. Um, I'm just curious what the general situation is in Vancouver, um, if they are, there are a lot of faith-based organizations that are against your initiative or for your initiative that are helping. I'm just wondering what the general situation is there with that. Yeah, that's a great question. There is, you know, there is a lot of heterogeneity um, amongst faith-based organizations. There are, there are organizations like the United Church in the downtown east side, uh, many Catholic uh, orders in the, in, in, the, in the downtown east side, which are supportive of harm reduction as a whole part of their, their mission about ministering to the poor. Um, there is, for example, there's a, there's a Sikh congregation that comes every, uh, every month to, to provide food for the poor, provide for, food for the people living in the downtown east side. Uh, at the same time, if you know Vancouver, you know that the Fraser Valley, which is sort of an ex-urban area, sort of up the Fraser River, uh, it's much more um, sort of fundamentalist Christianity. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, they, that uh, wing of Christianity has been uh, very supportive of the, um, the laws passed by several of their municipalities uh, making harm reduction illegal. Uh, so, for example, in Abbotsford and Chilliwack, uh, they have uh, outlawed needle exchange, outlawed methadone, despite the fact, as I said, that it's, you know, World Health Organization, the United Nations, and even a provincial government mandated necessity to be delivering harm reduction uh, in these areas. Uh, and yet the churches have been one of the forces uh, um, supporting the ban on harm reduction. So it's uh, every, every different angle. Uh, for the faith-based organizations from support and in, in fact delivery of harm reduction uh, to, to working to prohibit it. Hi there. Um, going forward, given the unanimous decision of the Supreme Court to strike down Harper government's rulings, um, are they going to still engage in some more deceitful or kind of like micro changing of things to get around the Supreme Court? Or is, what are they doing right now that's, are they still working on this? Or are they giving up on this? Or are they trying their usual deceitful tactics? The Supreme Court case, the Supreme Court decision was obviously great from the point of view of insight because it kept it open. Uh, however, it had, I think it's fair to say, uh, it's, it's not been uh, very helpful for groups who want to open new facilities. Uh, so it said that, you know, an exemption from the law is still required from the minister when it could have, it could have struck that down. Uh, they kept that in place. So groups in Victoria, uh, 
um, uh, London, Ontario, Montreal, Toronto, a bunch of other places who want Ottawa, who want to open facilities are still stuck with that, with the fact that they have to go to a Tory minister uh, and get his or her approval to open a facility. Uh, and the Supreme Court also defined a number of things that these groups have to do to, to, to get an exemption, uh, including proving that all of the neighborhood was behind uh, a facility. So there are many areas in the decision which can be used by people against the facility to keep them from opening. So even though the scientific evaluation showed that this, the, the, the facilities like this can have a very positive impact on these people's lives and health, uh, I think it will be probably a very long time before another one is opened. Uh, and I think what you'll probably see is that uh, uh, facilities will open uh, uh, as guerrilla facilities, like they did in Vancouver. The first facilities were not in sight, but in fact were facilities that were opened by the drug users themselves uh, and sort of the police sort of kept hands off um, and, and that's I think what's going to have to happen in other places that feel the need for these, for these facilities. Um, we're out of time really but let's just, let's just try to take a couple of these questions and maybe we could take them at the same time and, and make them really quick and brief. Uh, there's a couple of people here, there's a woman here and a woman here as well. Hi, I was just wondering um, if you could speak to how Canada handles violent crimes that have correlations with mental health, and I guess just sort of your opinions on how we handle it. And your question here? Um, downtown Eastside um, is uh, gradually being gentrified, and I'm wondering how these pressures um, are affecting insight and whether or not your location is in jeopardy? The second one first, and then okay. you want to take that? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question, and there certainly is gentrification pressures on the downtown east side. Um, in fact, the lot across from insight has been sold to a developer who's going to put up condos. Um, which just boggles my mind in many ways, but anyways. Um, I don't think that Insight's pos position is in jeopardy through that, um, but I think that one of the reasons wor that Insight works is because there is a concentration of people who need its services, uh, and that, you know, should um, these folks be pushed out of the downtown east side and be sort of dispersed throughout Vancouver, the job of getting to them and, and integrating them and engaging them in healthcare is going to be more difficult. To your question about violent crimes and mental health, I'd say the answer is it, it doesn't handle it very well. The, um, again, referring to the, the evidence that I've been seeing, the, uh, amongst the high-risk offenders who do commit a disproportionate amount of crime, there are huge mental health issues amongst that population. And what we've seen, for the most part, is that they are in a revolving door type of situation. And rather than having been treated, they are often put in the criminal justice system, which doesn't necessarily have the types of treatments that they would require. Fantastic. Thank you very much. So just before I thank, we thank the speakers, just quickly uh, remind everybody that we've been live streaming these, uh, all the conference presentations. So they'll be uh, archived on our website, parklandinstitute.ca, under the multimedia tab. And if you're into social media, please feel free to follow Parkland Institute on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, so the next session is with Michael Geist, which will be fantastic. So I hope you're all sticking around for that.